good afternoon it's wednesday the 20th of may 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to uk column news your host today mike robinson myself brian gerrish and we're delighted to be joined by david ellis now we've got an exclusive uh, for our viewers and listeners today we're taking a really good look at what we call the british government of occupation and the deep state and really every man and woman in uk needs to understand what's really unfolding i don't think i could put it any more bluntly than that mike no but uh, just before we get on to that stuff uh, of course the office for national statistics uh, released its latest numbers uh, yesterday so let's just have a, a brief look at this situation now so uh, excess mortality in the red uh, on screen uh, average deaths uh, on the in the orange there uh, and uh, we uh, have what we think are the uh, COVID deaths and the well these are the deaths that are being attributed to COVID if you believe what the government is saying and therefore the red shaded area at the moment represents the deaths that have resulted from lockdown uh, we've shown this each week that the ONS has uh, has pushed this out it's a really important point we have to keep uh, pushing it home uh, this is much more likely to be the uh, situation though if we if we believe what the Italian government has said, which is when they went look went looking at their statistics again uh, afterwards, uh, they they had uh, come up with a figure of twelve and a half percent of the deaths attributed to COVID were, you know, likely to be caused by COVID itself and not by some kind of underlying health issue. Um, if this is the case, uh, if we put that those sort of numbers on the UK uh, figures, this is what we get, and the red shaded area now represents lockdown deaths. Um, probably the reality is somewhere between these two positions, as we said before. But you know, this has to be uh, keep. We have to keep ramming this home, Brian, because uh, these deaths, excess mortality, largely due to lockdown. Due to lockdown yeah. Yes, is the key point. And the country, of course, brought to its knees by the economic shutdown as a result of this. Uh, absolutely. Now, of course, many people asking, how long is lockdown uh, going to, uh, to continue for, uh, or at least? to some degree social distancing let's leave it at that one and asda maybe gives us a clue because this is from their newsroom uh, and they're now talking about virtual queuing now of course uh question on many people's lips is if we have to be socially distanced and we have to be queuing outside this uh, outside the supermarket or a shop what happens in the winter when it's uh, pretty unpleasant weather uh, well asda suggesting a solution here which is they're describing as virtual queuing uh, so customers would log into their website uh, queue remotely and they'd be able to wait in their cars therefore uh, and uh, and when they're ready to go into this, the store they would be uh, notified I guess and, and able to go in um, so it's basically a way of booking your place in the queue uh, and they're saying or their chief executive Roger Burnley saying it's increasingly clear that COVID-19 is set to be a part of our lives for months to come uh, and so they're expecting long-term social distancing measures to be in place and the other news that came out yesterday of course along the same kind of lines uh, was the fact that the uh, uh, University of Cambridge has decided that they are not going to be uh, holding any physical classes uh, in the 2020-21 uh, academic year it's all going to be virtual uh, the statement said uh, the university is constantly adapting to changing advice as it emerges during this pandemic given that it's likely that social distancing will continue to be required the university has decided there will be no face-to-face -face lectures during the next next academic year so Brian that's a pretty incredible situation where uh, you know retail but also academic uh, institutions basically saying we're not coming out of this lockdown in, to any degree in the near future. No, and I can say that yesterday I spoke to quite a lot of people in local authorities around the country. Um, most of them were working uh, from home. They were saying how difficult it was. And when I asked, are you receiving information about when lockdown is going to be lifted? They're basically saying, well, they've said something about the 1st of July that we might hear something. So basically, we've got the whole of UK locked down on the basis of the government's manipulation of the COVID figures, uh, economy destroyed, and we're not coming out of house arrest anytime soon. So it seems. Now, the other thing we mentioned on Monday was uh, Chris Whitty, uh, chief medical officer, uh, basically bringing out a new symptom. Uh, he said that from Monday, all individuals should self-isolate if they develop a new continuous cough or fever or anosmia, anosmia. Uh, and uh, I was suggesting that this was uh, 
bit cynical and attempt to extend uh, the pressure on people to, to identify and self-isolate and so on. Uh, and uh, I was interested in the timing. Well, somebody very kindly uh, sent me an email yesterday giving a suggestion as, as the, to the timing of this, because, of course, we are just coming into the hay fever season. Uh, and the question here from A. Vogel, who produced antihistamines, is uh, can allergies cause you to lose your sense of taste and smell? Uh, and they're saying the loss of the sense of smell, otherwise known as anosmia, uh, often comes about as a result of an allergy. And they're making the point that uh, absolutely seasonal. seasonal. Uh, and of course, if you have hay fever and you start uh, uh, losing your sense of smell and taste, the government making sure through their behavioral yeah. advice, I'm sure, but they're making sure that you have this niggling doubt about whether it's actually the hay fever or whether you've got coronavirus. Yeah. Perhaps we could just bring in David Ellis very quickly. David, the whole country shut down, yet we've got other countries around the world that haven't had a lockdown at all. We've got plenty of American states that haven't had lockdowns. They've survived better um, than nations such as UK, which are still in this ridiculous lockdown. What's your view? Uh, my view is that they, that, Boris, well, it's no, don't call him Boris, call him his proper name, Alexander. Boris is his stage name. So Alexander, Gove and all the rest of the cabinet panicked for their political skins with the thought that they might see images of or more images of, of NHS hospitals uh, becoming overflowing like the one in North London at the start of the what was the policy change. And I think that what they've done is that they've took that political jujitsu saw the opportunity politically to to go into this drastic policy phase and the gambit really isn't save the nhs because they couldn't give a they couldn't give a monkeys about the nhs or the doctors because we've got matt hancock saying that now isn't the time for the doctors or nurses to be talking about a pay rise so they you know the tories don't really they, they don't give a monkeys about the nhs they want to sell it off the gambit really is stay at home, save the Tory party. So that's really what the score is. It's save our political skins. And this is just the, the means to the end. And I think that the majority of doctors that, that I was speaking to at the start of this all framed it with their first reaction, which is normally the correct one. So these are coal-faced doctors were saying, well, look, we get thousands of people die every year under flu conditions and none of the Tory party gave a flying and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to swear gave a flying rat's ass because that's the language that these doctors were using about those people dying previously so they then said well what's different now so that's the question so I think you know you, you join all this lot up and it's it's not save the NHS it's save the Tory party stay at home or stay alert or whatever other tosh I want to come up with and I think probably one of the key data points that you've just covered there is is Cambridge saying that they're not going to hold uh, university as normal. So, you know, you can pretty much take it as read that life as we know it has ceased to exist. And the majority of the population have given their compliance to this. That's yeah, the I, problem. That is the problem, David. Well, just put this meme up, which uh, was circulating on social media yesterday, immensely powerful because, of course, it's showing lines of thousands hundreds of thousands of people dying of everything from wars to famines to cancer but it's only surprisingly deaths due to uh, covid19 that suddenly get the red carpet of government attention well what has caused this government attention you're suggesting that the uh, conservatives are defending themselves and i'm sure that's part of the case um, but we want to move into what who is really governing the country and we say that is a cabal a government of occupation um, well on monday uh, again we uh, covered this from the times uh, this was a report which said that tobias elwood the chairman of the defense select committee uh, was calling for sir mark sedwell to give up his role as the head of the civil service uh, and instead concentrate on managing the response to the coronavirus crisis um, so here is uh, tobias elwood um, and uh, of course he's an mp uh, he famously uh, gave mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and open-heart massage to a wounded policeman uh, 
during one of the terror attacks in Westminster. Uh, and uh, of course, something that he couldn't do anymore because uh, you're not allowed to do that sort of thing under the present guidelines. Uh, he formerly uh, captain of the Royal Green Jackets. He served in Bosnia. Uh, and uh, well, what I had forgotten about Brian, uh, but was kindly reminded about last night, uh, is of course he was he is also a reservist with 77 Brigade. So he is one uh, of the uh, people that uh, General Sir Nick Carter was bragging about the other day uh, on his uh, during the COVID-19 live stream, one of the 20,000 reservists uh, that uh, 77 Brigade has on call. So my first question here uh, for you both uh, is, bearing in mind this man is the chairman of the Defence Select Committee and the Defence Select Committee is supposed to provide oversight and hold to account the Ministry of Defence, uh, hold to account the British Army, all the British Army brigades, whatever few are left. How can, that man, how can this man, David, uh, do that, carry out that role of holding 77 Brigade to account if he's a reservist in 77 Brigade? Well, the question to ask is, is that a conflict of interest? Because surely to be independent and chair a committee, you would not then be actively and effectively in service within one of the other, you know, I mean, he's wearing many hats, isn't he? Uh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. How many, hats, how many hats is he wearing? You know, if we want actual impartial oversight as a chair on, you know, as it stands at the moment, unless someone wants to explain, so I'm not prejudicing anything that comes up here, but he's in service. So he's at both ends of the job. Well, I'm sorry, that, that cannot be right. It just cannot be right. Now, I've met Tobias Elwood many years ago when I was lobbying in Parliament with a British security contractor that wanted to build corvettes and frigates in Devonport, make use of the redundant, you know, to make use of the yard and the uh, facilities there. Uh, and we were in the middle of discussing the concepts and um, Alan Duncan came over and just, inter and just annihilated the meeting. And that was the end of that. But I, I've got to say, I did, I did have, have a good bit of a go here with Tobias Elwood many years ago when he was a backbencher. He's subsequently been a minister and obviously now he's chair of DEFCON. So, I, you know, all these other MPs, particularly the opposition, Wayne David and all the other Labour uh, uh, shadow ministers and co, and even the Lords need to get their fingers out here. You know, this cannot be right. He's in service, in effect. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, now, of course, uh, the, the point of the Times article uh, was that uh, Tobias Elwood was calling for Mark Sedwell to take a step back from some of his roles because uh, we have uh, we were making the point uh, about uh, Sedwell's uh, position uh, as head of the National Security Council, as head of the Cabinet Office. He's also head of the Home Civil Service. Uh, and so he's in control of everything that we've got on screen at the moment. Uh, on the left-hand side, therefore, in control of all the security services, GCHQ, uh, MI5, MI6, and now the new, the new joint biosecurity center. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, through the cabinet office in control of the cabinet office's rapid response unit, which is the cabinet office's attempt to deal with so-called disinformation and misinformation, uh, and also 77th Brigade, um, which is working with the Cabinet Office to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, previously we had made the point that uh, he's also uh, effectively in control of the Foreign Office's counter disinformation and media development programme through Andy Price, and that was linked to the Integrity Initiative, uh, if you remember that. Uh, so uh, let's, let's bring this up to date then, um, because, of course, uh, Tobias Elwood, as head of DEFCOM, uh, is supposed to hold Mark Sedwell to account for his activities, but Tobias Edward, as, uh, Elwood, as we say, is uh, also working for 77 Brigade. So there's a bit of a bit of a roundabout going on there. Not quite sure how that works, uh, but uh, we should also uh, just remind everybody, of course, that Chris Bell, uh, who is uh, in charge of uh, the 77 Brigade, he is the head man, uh, is linked to Integrity Initiative. He was on the Integrity Initiative lists. Uh, another uh, 77 Brigade person, Diane Allen, uh, also linked to Integrity Initiative. So um, Diane Allen, former Royal Signals uh, and currently Intelligence Corps Reserve. She's a Lieutenant Colonel. Interestingly enough, 
She's a Lieutenant Colonel. Tobias Elwood is a Lieutenant Colonel. We're going to meet another Lieutenant Colonel in just a second. Uh, but she, uh, but Brigadier Chris Bell, he's the commander of 77 Brigade. His predecessor, Alistair Aiken, also appears on the list of Integrity Initiative personnel. So clearly, a, you know, very close links between 77 Brigade and the Integrity Initiative. Um, and, you know, we've got asked questions about how this all works. We, we've, we've now got active military people right in the heart of government. Tough. If if this had taken place 30 years ago, we, 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 we would have had panic amongst the political establishment because they would have been shouting and screaming. There's a there's a there's a military coup underway. Um, and what have we got here? We've, we've now got the elements of some form of coup uh, where this has been brought right into the power base at the heart of government. And there's not a whisper from MPs. Right. And just before we introduce uh, the third member of 77 Brigade that we want to talk about here, uh, I'll just mention this, uh, that uh, Lithuania uh, was pretty key to the 77 Brigade Integrity Initiative stuff. Uh, Lithuania... Uh, they considered to have expertise in dealing with Russia and malign influence and disinformation. Uh, and so uh, 77 Brigade took advice from Lithuania on how to deal with this. And in fact, much of the, uh, uh, 70, the, the Lithuanian t techniques to dealing with so-called disinformation from Russia ended up in 77 Brigade. Uh, how are they applying, them, applying it these days? That's the question. But let's meet the third member of 77 Brigade that we want to talk about here. Uh, and that is another Lieutenant Colonel. So Tobias Elwood, a Lieutenant Colonel. Diane Allen, a Lieutenant Colonel. Rupert Burridge. Uh, he's an interesting character. He's an extremely interesting character. And I'm going to thank you for the people who gave us the heads up to this story, which we had missed. Uh, it was the Daily Mail. Here's the story. Officer at the heart of the Army Secret Psychological Warfare Unit, pressured veteran who reported his security blunder. Now, this is a really extraordinary little story because what happened is that Lieutenant Colonel Burridge from 77 Brigade dropped a dozen of his business cards in the street. And these included his office and mobile telephone number an email address, but uh, a lot of other details of his contacts. Uh, they were picked up in Cottesmore, Rutland by an army veteran who passed them to a Mr. Usher, a former soldier who runs the respected Facebook group, Fill Your Boots. And uh, what then took place is where it gets very interested. So Mr. Usher contacted Lieutenant Colonel Burridge, which he was able to do because he had his business card. Um, but the colonel denied losing the cards and said it was a case of mistaken identity. He was pretty gruff, pretty blunt. Um, he relented only when the email address and phone numbers were read out to him. But he then angrily said he was busy fixing COVID before abruptly ending the call. And what then took place is just remarkable because Mr. Usher received a number of mysterious phone calls from military police officers demanding to know who found the cards. But when they were asked for an official case number, they refused to provide one. So the message out of this is we've got a very rude, we, arrogant, some people might say aggressive, Lieutenant Colonel Burridge. And yet we've got military police who work to threaten and intimidate those who are outside their authority because uh, they had no jurisdiction uh, at all. And they were trying to protect him. So why would this be? Now, we're going to ask people to jump back in time with us to the 22nd of April when we'd had information about 77 Brigade. And let's remind ourselves what we were being told, that it was set up uh, with much internal army MOD and cabinet fanfare as the Army Information Warfare Unit um, against external threats such as Russia, but also UK internal security threats. And the person said we were mega puffed up as the cream. So we can imagine this. People selected, come and join our new unit. You are going to be the creme of the creme. Highly structured, secretive operations with rooms within rooms on top of the basic military need to know. Regular army personnel and reservists increasingly sidelined as organisations expanded via the cabinet office and links with outside agencies. This is the really dangerous stuff. Google, Twitter, Facebook and other unknowns working with 77 Brigade. 
and an influx of what was called IT geeks, unknown professional background and provenance, and adoption of informal, unmilitary operational conduct. So the person said that essentially they created a gang of people, a gang. And it went on, um, the regular army personnel were largely barred from the inner sanctum, except for the top few. Surveillance of public, private, social media sites and comment was expanded into ever increasing areas of 77 Brigade interest. We need information on this person or that group. No information is given to the uh, person in 77 Brigade. They're just told to get on with it, get spying. A breakdown of the professionalism. This is repeated several times, laddish, geeky way. It's fun to spy on people. It's a bit of a laugh. We get a power kick from it. This is very dangerous. Increasing sense that under the fun layer, the organization was sinister and becoming threatening to people. Now, when you see that statement and we think about Lieutenant Colonel Burridge, you dare question him. Well, actually, you're offering to give his business cards back and you get threatened by the military police. And any questioning of 7-7 Brigade role and ethics is described as a no-no. So we asked who regulates the spying activity of 77 Brigade. And I think you've just shown, Mike, that nobody regulates it because there is no regulation at it, all. There's a conflict of interest there, for there's sure. There's a conflict of interest. So let's put this gentleman back on screen. Now, something very interesting is there in the Daily Mail article, which probably a lot of people missed, but the story was spun to some extent by the Daily Mail. So this is one of the first paragraphs formed in 2015. 77 Brigade is based Denison Barracks in Berkshire, it specialises in, quote, psychological warfare, including using Twitter and Facebook to challenge false claims. Is that what he meant by fixing COVID? Uh, well, we'll ask that question at the end of the segment, Mike, so don't, uh, don't forget that one. General Sir Nick Carter, the Chief of the General Staff, last month revealed that 77 Brigade was used, being used to combat disinformation about the spread of the virus the unit is understood to have teamed up with the security services to thwart Chinese and Russian online propaganda. So Daily Mail helping get back into the government line that anybody challenging uh, what the government says about COVID-19 has got to be working for the Russians and the Chinese. And it's done here again. The Mail on Sunday revealed in December 2018 how 77 Brigade has been targeted by Russian state journalists. So basically the message that the Daily Mail is spinning is that the only people questioning UK COVID-19 policy are Russian and Chinese um, assets. Mm. And I think this was done in a calculated way by the Daily Mail. Now, before we bring David back in and just ask him what he thinks about this, uh, this was part of the original statement in the article, Lieutenant Colonel Rupert Burridge, a commander in 77th Brigade, which is leading efforts to counter COVID-19 disinformation. This is nothing about the Russians and the Chinese. This is about anybody who is daring to challenge the government policy. David, we've got more on this, and I think you'll be staggered at what's to come, but this is immensely dangerous that we now have a significant uh, brigade in the British Army turned on the British people to spy on them in order to support the government policy, the same government that is helping to run 77 Brigade, brigade in the first place. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, none of this can be can you know can be left unchallenged and unquestioned because it's it's just you know you just start off with the relationship between Elwood and and Sedwell it's too close this man can't be calling for him to be going into a position because they're they're connected by service and officers so what previously used to be a domain of the police special branch and MI5 for domestic activity now seems to be that we've got and this is the question have we got let's go do that again have we got a brigade of the British Army on active service looking at the domestic or, or, or you know, dealing with the domestic population? I, I don't believe this is normal or has happened before. If someone wants to set a, you know, point me out to a precedent, I'd be very grateful. 
So I've got I've got some very specific questions with this. Uh, so obviously what you framed up here, um, although we've discussed, is actually sort of, you know, a lot of it's um, just coming into the coming into the fore. So uh, what are the costs of 77 Brigade? What's this costing? Uh, what are they actually doing? That needs to be properly articulated. Uh, who really is the enemy? And what are they going to do to that enemy? Um, so I've got to qualify that from two perspectives, both from both from uh, ex-admirals, and that's Admiral Lord West and Admiral Chris Parry. How does this increase our fighting capability? So I'd like to know how it is. And secondly, I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty certain that Elwood can't evaluate this or give oversight because he's in an office doing this job. So th that's that's you know we've got a real serious problem here in Defence Committee. Which I understand is is run through the cabinet office, so that goes round in a back in, a, in another loop, doesn't it? Um, so uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty certain that Lord Owen many many years ago, then David Owen, shut down the internal spinning of the Soviet propaganda uh, offices in London. So I want to know what's gone wrong since then, or what's gone right, if you want to look at it the other way. But how we've how we've ended up with all this? Yeah, because it just seriously it cannot be right it isn't it isn't right david this this effectively is a coup at the at the center of the british government let's follow it through bring the guy back on screen here he is mr uh, burridge lieutenant colonel and why do i think he's a lieutenant colonel i'll explain that in a minute but he's a man of mysterious professional pedigree uh, we've got him here as 77 brigade army officer uh, we've got him here as champion of women in the armed forces speaking at the Warsaw Security Forum. And if you start looking at what this man has been doing, David, he is all over the sorts of organisations we've been warning were helping to build the uh, European Defence Union. He is right amongst all that stuff. And you just say, what is this man doing? But let's bring this in because you don't have to get too far into his... Uh, professional history to see that he was conventions manager at the London School of Economics on women, peace and security. How, how does that work? How does that work, Mike? Well, I'll show you how it works. Um, is he really a lieutenant colonel? Well, here's his LinkedIn page and we discovered that he hasn't yet been in the army for three years. Oh. So June uh, 2017, we haven't quite got there. So this man has not been an army officer for three years, and yet he's a lieutenant colonel. Has well, he gone gone straight in as a lieutenant uh, colonel? Either then? he's gone straight in, and uh, my opinion is lieutenant colonel's about the highest rank you can give somebody without the fact they're gonna make an idiot to themselves the moment they're asked a professional question to do with the military and the army. So you can just about get away with it as a lieutenant colonel, you wouldn't if you were much higher. And that's why so many of those guys that you've highlighted are lieutenant colonels. Uh, but here he is saying he's only been in for three years. So he's been parachuted out of the London School of Economics into this army unit to spy with his colleagues, presumably on the British public. And if you dare get near him, you're gonna get threatened by the military police. This is the breakdown of utter breakdown of democracy. But uh, we got more here because people can check this for himself. Here it is, Dr. Rupert Burridge, SO1 Human Security at British Army. And if you have a look, what is he? He's a professional academic, University of Oxford, University of Cambridge, London School of Economics. So he appears to be a professional academic. He writes on military security, women and quote, global peace. Not sure who he's working with to achieve global peace, but now he gets elevated to a Lieutenant Colonel. But there's also some evidence that he may actually be a reservist, but he's obviously a little bit too shy of revealing that uh, track. Um, but yes, he said he's now fixing COVID. And how is he fixing COVID? Is he doing that by fixing anybody who dares challenge it? David, I'm gonna bring you back in because um, this is taking over what's left of democracy in UK. We don't know who these people are. We don't know who appointed them. We don't know what they're doing. As you said, we don't know the budgets and they are now deciding who can and who cannot 
criticize the British government not on military or security policy but on what happens to our health in relation to a winter virus something very dangerous is going on here it, it is very dangerous because where we used to have separation of offices before it seems that all that's gone the oversight's gone the MPs are not doing their job as we've seen over and over again they're silent on this issue or blind or they're just you know they go into the the House of Commons library and they get more blurb and they don't bother looking at it because the blurb's no good to start with. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, if you, if you had to sort of take a snapshot and say, well, you know, actually, you know, is there more to this man? Is there, is there another hat? Um, that's my question. But I've got to say from a sort of Mr. Putin or a Jing Xiaoping perspective, you know, I just imagine they're just laughing. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that they would take any of this seriously, that there are any actual fighting threat to whatever these people are doing at all. It seems to be some internal domestic monitoring thing yeah. where he thinks he's going to fix COVID just because people are questioning it. What's he going to yeah. do? Fix Peter Hitchens as well, is he? Well, uh, it's, it's just, you know, these MPs have got to get their bloody fingers out and start chirping up and getting, getting all this sort of um, getting to grips with this lot. Because, um, you know, how on earth can we have you know, British military do, running around doing this stuff on a domestic basis. It, it just cannot be right. That's not uh, the bit David, British military's job. David, it's not right. And let's put in a bit more information for our viewers and listeners. Let's show 77 Brigade as it really sits in the British Army. We have to come to the British Army 6th Division for hybrid warfare. This is the largest of the British Army's three divisions. So we can't actually put troops in the field but we can create this huge spying organization. We got the first signal brigade, we got 77 brigade, we got the first intelligence, we've got surveillance and reconnaissance brigade, we've got the seventh air defense brigade, we've got HQ 11th signal and West Midlands brigade, and we've got the specialized infantry group. And here's some comment from a Lieutenant General uh, General Jones, who said the 6th Division focuses on cyber electronic warfare intelligence, information operations and unconventional warfare through niche capabilities such as the specialised infantry battalions. So if you question the British government on the lies that it's pumped out over COVID-19 deaths, are you going to get a visit by the specialist infantry battalion? <laughs> well, we just don't know. But it goes on. The British Army describes 77th Brigade as an agent of change. Well, they've certainly done that because we, we can't speak out now as, as a, a civilian in UK, a member of the public, in case we get a visit from the military police using targeted information activity and outreach to contribute to the success of military objectives in support of commanders and as a fundamental part of the Army's integrated action model. It currently comprises five groups, information activity group, task group, outreach group, support group, and staff corps. This is a massive octopus at the heart of British society, immensely dangerous. And now we bring in mysterious men like Rupert Burridge from London School of Economics to help run this. And if you dare challenge what this man is doing, you're gonna get a visit from the military police. So. I just noticed that when he was back in the London School of Economics, he's working in a department alongside this lady. Now, I'm not saying this lady's done anything wrong. I'm just interested in her political interests. So you see that she's a research officer in the Centre for Women, Peace and Security. So we can presume that she was sat alongside Rupert Burridge because he's conventions manager for the Centre for Women, Peace and Security. Uh, but if you have a look at the sort of things she's tweeting out, um, she's talking about militarised thinking and why now is the time to challenge the current system of power and patriarchy to revive the women, peace and security agenda and set a, quote, post-pandemic framework based on well-being, not political gain. <laughs> Could it be that that's what Lieutenant Colonel Burridge believes in? Mm. And uh, we just add that it doesn't take you long to find that what this lady is talking about is linked through to this of one of many organizations, the Co School of Global Affairs. And um, it says that their graduates understand the in interconnected nature of world challenges with their focus on human dignity, their 
toolkit of strategic analytic and relation relational skills and their portfolio of global experiences they become the connective tissue among ideas people and disciplines in government ngos and the private sector so could it be that we've got these people working at the heart of british government to change our society and we're simply not being told david just a couple of words because we've got more stuff to cover this is outrageous it is outrageous because in essence what you're describing is a soviet east german model of, of operating and where we thought in Britain we've got a functioning liberal democracy, you know, this tells us that we've got severe problems um, that need dealing with. So this isn't fundamentally policy of the people. I don't believe anybody's voted for this or had it put to them in a manifesto. So it's not policy of the people via their MPs or of Parliament. So it's being drop shipped in from elsewhere. We've got to bear one fundamental in, in, in mind now with this, and you've covered it many, many times on the column, and that's the government's fusion policy, which is literally to fuse the British police and the British military and the security services into one single point organisation. So a paramilitary security service. And yep. that's got to be where everybody's got to go. Alarm bells, everyone. This thing is coming towards us rapid during this COVID period. You need to get on your phone, get your Twitter out, get your pens out and get onto your MP in a group, as, or if you can, or individually, and get this, get this put across to your MP that you don't want it and it needs stopping. Now, that's prescriptive. That's an instruction to your MP. Not an, not, not, a, not an ask, this is tell your MP, I don't want this. And David, we'll add to that, of course, what these uh, very ignorant and arrogant MPs don't understand is that the revolution always eats its young. So if they think they're gonna live a privileged life clear of this dictatorship, when it finally installs itself, they're very much mistaken. OK, we've got to move on. Uh, if you like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there. And we'd just like to thank everybody that helped advertise our news today. There is no doubt that UK Column is now under covert censorship by the British government and its agencies. And any help you can give to promulgate the information we're putting out is uh, gratefully received. Uh, now, uh, the counter-terrorism and sentencing bill is being introduced to Parliament today. Uh, and, uh, well, it's pretty interesting what they're uh, talking about here. Uh, mean terrorist offenders who do not receive an extended determinate sentence will no longer be eligible for a standard determinate sentence and will instead be sentenced to a sentence for offenders of particular concern. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you don't know what that means, it means that they will be subject to a minimum license period of 12 months after being released from custody, even if they spend spend their full term uh, in prison. Now, uh, this is what it's all about, uh, keeping people safe. Our first duty is to keep people safe. Doesn't matter how much of a di dictatorship you're running, as so long as people are kept safe, apparently. Um, and uh, so they're saying the maximum penalty following uh, for the following offences will increase from 10 to 14 years. That's membership of a, of a prescribed organisation, supporting a prescribed or organisation, attending a place used for terrorist training. Uh, they say that this bill will uh, bring in changes to the Terrorism Prevention and Investigation Measures Act 2011, um, and uh, that will lower the standard of proof uh, required for imposing uh, a Terrorism Prevention and Investigation Measures notice. So the standard of proof is big lord. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's going to specify new measures that can be applied to subjects who've received those notices and so on. Uh, but I think this was the bit that uh, grabbed my attention. Uh, Brian, let's bring it on screen. Amend the Counterterrorism Act 2008 so that a court can find any offence with a maximum penalty of more than two years to have a terrorist connection. <laughs> that's, right? That's any offence that has a maximum penalty of more than two years can now, if this bill passes as it becomes an act, now be considered to have a terrorist connection, whether or not, it seems, it's demonstrated that there's actually a terrorist connection. So, David, <laughs> where do we go with that? 
well, you put that together with your paramilitary force and you have an absolute state, you know, a very s severe state monopoly on violence. Uh, yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. So there's a whole lot more in that bill uh, that we haven't got time to cover today, uh, but we will uh, in the coming in the coming days. We'll keep an eye on that. Now, in the meantime, uh, let's move on to this. Um, the United States, well, actually, over the last couple of days, uh, the World Health Assembly has been taking part, place. Uh, this is a World Health Organization uh, or uh, conference, uh, and uh, it began on Monday. And so Mike Pompeo, the uh, Secretary of State for the United States, decided to release this uh, press release, Taiwan's exclusion from the World Health Assembly. Now, he is... Uh, uh, criticizing the World Health Organization for what he described as bowing to Chinese pressure uh, and not inviting Taiwan to attend the uh, World Health Assembly. Now, Taiwan isn't uh, recognized uh, as a separate nation uh, by the United Nations, and therefore uh, it wasn't, didn't, wasn't, it, it, they, they had to take some particular uh, steps in order to invite Taiwan to the thing, which they didn't do. Um, and so Pompeo having a go about this, uh, he told the uh, World Health Organization Jet Director General uh, that uh, that he had the legal power and precedent uh, to include Taiwan this year. Yet, he says he instead chose not to invite Taiwan under pressure from the People's Republic of China. Uh, the Director General's lack of independence deprives the Assembly of Taiwan's renowned scientific expertise on pandemic disease and further damages the WHO's credibility and effectiveness at a time when the world needs it most. So that was on Monday. Then yesterday, Donald Trump publishes a letter, uh, and this is giving the World Health Organization 30 days to commit to substantial changes in how it operates. It's four pages of anti-Chinese diatribe, uh, basically accusing the Chinese of all kinds of stuff. Uh, he says the World Health Organization has repeatedly made claims about the coronavirus that were either grossly inaccurate or misleading, and he's blaming the Chinese for this. Uh, and, uh, well, the World Health Organization, not very excited about this letter, but the pressure is all on the Chinese. So they're not terribly happy about it. Uh, this is what the... Uh, the uh, permanent representative to the UN in, in Geneva said China strongly protests, pr protests and firmly opposes the behavior of the United States here. This was echoed uh, by the Russians uh, who under a fair amount of pressure themselves because despite the fact that Russiagate has been proven now to be completely false, uh, the US State Department apparently still attempting to push forward with that narrative. Uh, and uh, this is Sergei Rybakov here, the Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, saying, as we can see, the United States has stepped up all our pressure on China. If the United States really hopes to take advantage of the pandemic to harm China's and Russia's positions in the world, I hope its calculations are wrong. So this can't be overstated. China and Russia seeing this as a prelude to war, and they're starting to, to, to express this in the statements that they're making. They're deeply unhappy with the position the United States, the United States is taking at the moment. Uh, but the question is, where does that leave the UK? Uh, well, uh, the UK is in this position. Of course, we are still quite happy to work with the uh, Chinese, apparently, with respect to 5G. Um, and Imperial College uh, has now entered into a joint venture uh, with Huawei. Uh, it's so new, they haven't put the text on the page yet. Imperial College Huawei Data Science Innovation Lab. This is a £5 million uh, tie-up, uh, which will see uh, Huawei's indoor 5G equipment and an AI platform installed in their campus, uh, in Imperial College's campus. Uh, and uh, so various projects going on between uh, Imperial College and Huawei, but of course the UK government still refusing to uh, remove the possibility of Huawei uh, being involved in the 5G rollout in the UK. And of course, uh, this is something that, def that the Defence Committee in particular uh, feels is absolutely the wrong approach. They want the Defence Committee uh, absolutely echoing the uh, US position on this. They want China removed from this whole thing. Um, so that's going on. Uh, we should just mention, of course, that the US and the UK have just finished two weeks of trade negotiations because we're going to have a new uh, US-UK trade agreement in the not-too-distant future. Whether this Huawei thing is, is uh, being rolled into that negotiation or not, I don't know, but certainly the US still 
considering imposing sanctions on the UK for the UK continuing to work with Huawei. So US really pushing pressure on China, but not just China, uh, because uh, this is going on as well. Uh, Iran now has four oil tankers in the Atlantic and another one coming out of the uh, Mediterranean into the Atlantic in the next day or so, all heading over to Venezuela, full of oil. Um, and the US basically saying that if they don't turn back, that they are going to uh, take some action. If they haven't made clear exactly what action they're going to take, it might involve seizing the ships. The Chinese and the Russians, therefore, accusing, and the Iranians accusing the US of piracy if they yep. attempt to do this. Um, and so this is all being ramped up uh, at the same time that we're all in lockdown. Uh, and just finally on this one, uh, we'll just, we have to mention the F-35 because, of course, for a long time now, we've been highlighting the fact that the Turkish, the Turkish situation is a problem. Uh, we've said, what a turkey here. But basically, this is because the F-35's engines, the contract to, to um, maintain those was uh, given to a Turkish company. But because Turkey had bought uh, Russian S-400 uh, missile defense systems, uh, the U.S. decided that uh, Turkey could no longer be involved in the F-35 program. Uh, and so we asked quite a long time ago, where will the F-35 engines be maintained now? Can we have an answer, please, Defense HQ? We never got an answer from that. That was a couple of years ago. Uh, well, there is uh, more information coming out on this. F-35 faces uh, parts problems after Turk's expulsion. So it's now finally hitting the news. Uh, that according to the uh, the GAO in the United States, uh, 15 key components of the F-35 once produced in Turkey are not being produced uh, at the needed production rate, uh, that servicing isn't going on, uh, that between August 2017 and July 2019, the number of parts delivered uh, late increased from under 2,000 to more than 10,000, uh, roughly 60% of parts shortage attrib attributable to 20 suppliers. So as we predicted, uh, the F-35 program has not been able to make up the shortfall uh, that has come about as a result of Turkey being expelled from the project. And of course, we're not hearing anything about this in UK press as the knock-on effect back to uh, UK F-35s. It's, it's just quietly pushed under the carpet. Yes, absolutely. And another thing that, uh, well, in this case, it was David Ellis predicted this one or forecast this one, that Rolls-Royce were going to have to uh, downsize. Well, COVID is being used as the excuse for downsizing. Uh, no, so. Sorry, I've got a chuckle on this one. You could not make this up, no, could you? So uh, we go from a winter flu virus to the fact that a major um, uh, arms manufacturer can't function. Well, in, in this case, of course, the, 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 this is particular downsizing is going to uh, is going to be on the civilian side but yeah. with fusion who knows these days yeah. uh, so rolls-royce proposes major reorganization to address medium-term impact of covid19 uh, and they're saying they're expected to lose at least 9,000 jobs from their global workforce of 52,000 more many of those jobs because this is in the civilian civilian aviation sector uh, many of those jobs will be in the uk so they're in negotiations with uh, unions at the moment to decide where and when uh, and uh, there's likely to be uh, a cuts in plant and property so actually f factories closing completely um, so this proposed uh, reorganization is going to save them apparently 1.3 billion pounds. Uh, so let's have a look and see what uh, Warren East, the CEO of Rolls-Royce, had to say. And I think this is the key point, David. This is not a crisis of their making, is what he's saying, but it's a crisis that they have to face and they have to deal with. Uh, what are your thoughts? All right, let's take it from the top then. So, uh, yeah, this Rolls-Royce thing, I mean, this that they prepared, they were doing pre preparatory work to divide their business into silos. So uh, civilian aerospace, uh, military, MOD, and the reactors. So all of the businesses are pretty much in self-contained packets. And if they wanted to sell them, it would be relatively easy to do it uh, under, the, under that framework. So let's start with your tweet, Mike, that you referred to. That needs retweeting for a start off because there's some questions to be asked there. So let's come at the F-35 uh, where Rolls have got a, a bit of a hand with BAE in the engines and all the rest of it. Uh, Pierre Spray did actually say the F-35 was a turkey and any nation that went to war with it would lose. So, you know, what, you know, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. Is this, you know, is there some substance to this? So I've got to say, right from the work, right from the start with this COVID Chinese pretext, 
I was asking a lot of the senior officers, were we already at war with China and just didn't know it? And this is a form of the hybrid perpetual all means warfare. And this is why we've got all this 77 Brigade stuff going on. Um, so there's that. But we've got some real key data points here with some Chinese stuff again. And I'll come on to the tankers in a minute. But Gordon Brown selling all the gold to China for 10 pence. All right. We've got China involved with our domestic uh, well, or, or military piles, uh, uh, the, the FISMAT reactors. Uh, and now we've got 5G. You know, this big sort of Chinese gambit all the while. But, you know, we're potentially having all this, pre, you know, pretext to war with China. Um, Russia's getting involved. If there's a war, and this is what I'm stressing, is if there's a war with China now, the outcome will be global government. So let's just say that those four tankers go down there to China and there's some sort of military incident. Um, what then happens? So this is the question, you know, this is where we are now under this under this kind of period. You know, this is deadly serious stuff. Really deadly serious stuff. And all we keep seeing is pretext to war over and over again with China. You know, they're not stupid. These people have practiced Sun Tzu for thousands of years. They're very good at it. They're much probably, you know, there's a there's an argument somewhere that they could potentially be better at it than the West. So, you know, if if Russia and China pally up and they make some sort of a stand on this issue, where that leaves Britain, Five Eyes and, you know, the sort of relative West, at, at that point, because, you know, are we heading to war? Is that what is that is that what's really going on here? Well, we're locked you know, down. We're just not being we're just not we're just not being told it because the modern all means hybrid warfare precludes the domestic population from knowing really what's the, the full SP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, I, th I think that's the key bit of the summing up all of this all massive, turbulent geopolitics going on whilst the UK population is simply under house arrest. And uh, you've given our audience some some uh, good advice. Get writing to those MPs, get on to them, jolt them awake. That's essentially needed. But really, the first step for the UK population is to be out of lockdown, uh, because until we're out of lockdown, we can't deal with what to me I'll describe it as a coup. We are watching a government of occupation install itself it's very much like a virus that's the irony isn't it we've got a government of occupation installing itself uh, by a quiet coup inside um, the power base of our democracy and if it's not stopped we can see where it's going by your change to the law there mm. mike i think we better end there david thank you very much for joining us good to see you again uh, we'll say to our audience uh, action conquers fear so don't sit there being fearful get doing things but the first objective is for uk population to get their freedom back where we can start dealing with these issues we'll leave it there thanks for joining us bye-bye